Thank you. Well, I'm very pleased to, to talk to you about some of the applications. So um, Isabel talked about um, this French police inspector Bertillon. So here is the sort of full story. Uh, this, this to me was, I, I think this is the first application of face recognition in a sense. The, the British Parliament passed an act called the Habitual Criminal Act in 1869. And the purpose was that people who are habitual criminals should be penalized more than the first time offenders. Okay, so first time offender gets one year of prison, second time gets five years, and third time, I don't know what they'll do to him, but that was the idea. And people, when they're arrested, they often use an alias. They don't give their true name. So, so they were looking for a system by which, based on anthropomorphic measurements, by which they could tell, is it the same person or not, okay? So this guy proposed a very elaborate system where different parts of the body were measured. And then a photograph was also captured. And also if there were some markings on the face like a mole or a tattoo, that was also recorded. But then this system, as you can imagine, is very cumbersome. I mean, the body measurements could be quantized and could be written on an index card. But the storing of the photograph became a problem. And this is what led to the adoption of fingerprint recognition by the Scotland Yard. And so in 1905, uh, the Scotland Yard adopted fingerprint identification. No. Yeah. So you know, it's only a small part of the body and it gives much better performance uh, than face. And even to date, by the way. And that's why many of the applications of face recognition are getting hampered because they are not meeting the performance. So as you know, Android phones have a face unlock mechanisms, but after Apple introduced the face, uh, fingerprint touch ID, you know, people do not use the face recognition that much to unlock the phone. And also it's relatively easier to hack, spoof attack, launch a spoof attack against the face as opposed to fingerprint. Fingerprint is not perfect, but it's more elaborate process to spoof a fingerprint ID system than a face recognition system. Yeah, curiosity, in 1905, what, what did they know about the, the uniqueness? Of the well, so, so there, were, there were some pioneers who had been publishing papers in Nature and so on. The first paper on fingerprint appeared by Galton and Henry in about 1888, showing what, how to classify fingerprints at the broad level based on the ridge flow into five classes, left loop, right loop, whirl. And then what, what, because it's a structured pattern, they knew what landmarks to use. And those landmarks were called minutia points. And to date, those, that representation still exists. Okay, uh, so that's, that's what, and, and that's fairly invariant representation in the sense that so in a good quality fingerprint, you may have about 100 minutia point landmarks, but all, all 100 landmarks do not have to match. Even if 20 or 30 match, you can make a fairly good ID based on that. So, so face is a natural mechanism to do the recognition, and Isabel showed that how the attention focuses on the faces in a scene. Um, so everyone has a face, so there's this universality thing. A lot, not everybody has fingerprints. Some, finger, some people have fingerprints which are wiped out uh, because of manual labor or the it's sensing is very difficult, but face is easy to sense, right? The other advantage of face recognition is that I can acquire it in a covert manner, surveillance cameras, remotely at a distance, no problem, uh, and also in a multispectral. Right? The face doesn't have to be in visible band. You can do infrared. That's why we can do nighttime recognition using face recognition. Right? You can get depth information as well for the face. And then the ma main advantage of face is there's a large legacy database. All of us are in some face database. The driver license, passport, visa, whatever. All of us have. So it's a natural way to recognize people in terms of the applications. So what are the applications of face recognition? One of the most popular applications and probably successful is deduplication. 
So what does that mean is we want to make sure that one person has one ID, government issued ID document, right? So how do you get a driver license? You go to the motor vehicle bureau, take a birth certificate, couple of other identification documents, right? But those can be easily forged, right? And you can change your name a little bit or adopt somebody else's name. So face matching is the only way to find out that one person does not have two different driver licenses. And that's true. State Department is using that for visa applicants, for passport applications, and so on. Search, surveillance, targeted advertisement. If you saw the movie Minority Report, of course, they were not using face recognition in that. They were using eye recognition, iris recognition, but that's the kind of a scenario. Mobile phones, I already mentioned, wearable devices. The other reason which is, drying, uh, which is pushing the popularity of face recognition is the, is the hardware, um, both the processing speed, the memory speed, as well as the, the, the cameras, which can be very easily embedded at a very low cost, right? So, you know, one of the vendors I talked to said, well, they can do 1.5 million templates matching per second per core. So th that, that's also sort of, now leads to large scale deployments. And the other thing which has happened is that uh, there have been benchmarks over the time which has pushed the technology recognition algorithm. So the, I'll, I'll go into it in a little bit. But unfortunately, it's only now that we are looking at unconstrained face images. From 1993 to 1998 and, and even up to 2013, most of the, most of the benchmarks were sort of frontal face images with some limited amount of changes in the expression and pose. So now, in order to understand the applications, we need to see how fa what are the ways in which face recognition systems operate. So the simplest thing is one-to-one -one comparison or what is called verification. So in this particular case, just imagine you are traveling through the to the TSA counter at the airport, the person looks at your, your driver license, looks at your face, and does a comparison, right? Suppose we replace that TSA agent by, a, by, a, by an automated system where your driver license is scanned and your photo is taken by a camera in this booth, and then we want, to, we want to compare the two and say it's the same person. This is not an easy problem in this particular scenario because with all the different markings and different driver, different states have different driver licenses with different markings. There may be age difference. Driver license is good for, what, 10 years or five years, depending on where you are. You know, so this can still be a difficult problem even though the expression is neutral and the lighting is uniform and so on. But anyway, this is a one-to-one -one comparison. The second problem is search, which is one-to-many comparisons. So then we, we have this notion of probe, which is the query, and then we have the gallery. So now we are searching this database of a um, very large number of people, and we, we say this is the person. So, Again, there are two ways in which the system can work, closed set or open set. What that means is closed set assumes that the person we are looking for is in the database. But that's not always true, right? I mean, if you have a, if you have a watch list scenario, again, looking at the airport applications, you have a Department of Homeland Security maintains a watch list, which could be a few hundred thousand people and everybody coming in, their photo is taken and they check whether this person is in the watch list or not. Okay, so, so in most cases we need, if you operate in the open set, you need, a, you need a reject threshold. You need to say this person is not in the database. And if you start playing around with that reject option, then the performance of the current state of the art system drops significantly. Okay. The size of N can be very large. So now FBI wants to do the face search and they, they think that by end of this year, they'll have 50 million database, okay? In India, they have already collected face images of 900 million people. And they say, well, we would like to explore that possibility. And by the end of this year, it will be 1 billion faces. 
Uh, I mean, the, I don't think the performance will scale to that level yet. Now, in many, many scenarios, we also don't necessarily have to do a fully automated search because the system is not capable. So we want to do semi-automated search in the sense that we want to filter the database and present to the human operator top 20 or uh, retrieve faces and let the operator make the decision. So this is a case where you, you, ca you got some image from the surveillance video. Now I want to search this 100 million database or whatever and the system presents some top candidates and now the operator looks at it and say, aha, this is the guy, okay? In fact, this is actually, this is a actual search we did against an 80 million database. And this guy came at rank seven out of the 80 million. And this was not, I mean, he was never arrested. The younger brother was not, never arrested before, so he never had a mugshot in the, in the police database. This was from a social media photo. So what is the state of the art? So now we have talked about verification and search, so the, here is the state of the art. So I'm showing you four different databases here. This is the FRGC version 2.0 2006, and you know, NIST has played a very valuable role in, in doing this analysis. And this has been going on for since 1997 when the first ferret test was done. At that time, the performance was miserable. But now, on these frontal photos collected in a laboratory environment, essentially, and later for uh, operational database. This, these are showing true accept rate or genuine accept rate at 0.1% false accept rate. That is, we are willing to have accept a mistake one in 1,000. And so the accuracy is 99.9% .9 or something like that. So that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. MBGC is another database test which was done by NIST, and here people were allowed to have some slight variations in expression and pose, the performance drops a little bit. Okay. Then these two databases, this was in, released in 2007, LFW called Label Faces in the Wild by the University of Massachusetts. So these were downloaded face images from the, in, from the web of famous personalities. Okay. So there were about 5,000 subjects and uh, so. So again, if we do the verification, so again, it's a, when, you, when you report the performance, it also depends on what protocol you're using, okay? So the protocol which University of Massachusetts suggested, UMass suggested, was not very practical, okay? So people were only reporting the accuracy without worrying about the false accept rate, okay? And while they, they they said, okay, we will do this evaluation on 3,000 genuine pairs and 3,000 imposter pairs, and we'll do 10-fold cross-validation. So in each fold, there were only 300 genuine and 300 imposter. So you really couldn't get the false accept rate with 300 imposters to any reasonable value. And then later, Cassia in China proposed a more, uh, a new protocol which was, which was better. And, and so the idea is that accuracy dropped now to 88% true accept rate at the same 0.1% false accept rate. And about a year ago, IARPA, the federal agency, announced a program called Janus. And again, their aim is to push the technology, and so they released a a database called IJBA, which is available over the NIST website. And here, the database is more challenging than the LFW. These are also downloaded from the web of famous personalities, but now the pose variation is significantly larger. Okay, so you can't always even detect the face and to find the landmarks. But they do use the crowdsourcing to provide you with the, with the detected bounding box as well as the landmarks. How many images? So these are about um, uh, 2,000 images of about five, uh, 2,000 images and video. So it, they provided both the images and the video. And of about uh, 
I, I forget now, 200 to 500 individuals. 500, right. So the number of individuals is not as large as in the LFW, uh, but the variations are a lot more. Okay. And now you can see that the performance drops significantly on this database at the same uh, true accept rate. So now we move to the next, which is the search mode. And, um, and so we implemented the search on the, on the uh, this is a law enforcement database of about 1 million face images of about 300,000 subjects. So, but these are mugshot images. And again, I'm, the report here is closed set. These two, first two rows are closed set. Retrieval at rank one, retrieval at rank 10. That is the best, highest similarity score was found for the true mate at rank one and at rank 10. So at rank 10, the performance is quite good, but at rank one, it's not as good. And in the, and in the mugshot, even though officers are taking it at the booking station, there's still a lot more variability than uh, because of, you know, people are tilting their head or they may have a bandage on the face or whatever, you know, so. Uh, but the point is that the performance on IJBA drops quite a bit, both LFW and IJBA, the performance drops quite a bit. And this is not quite ready for deployment for any large scale application with this kind of error rate. In the open set, one reports false negative identification rate at some specified false positive identification rate. So a 10% false positive identification rate is not very practical. So if you look at 1% false positive identification rate, the false negative identification rate is, 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 is rather high. So, so what this is showing is that face recognition is very difficult, especially as we move from very controlled settings to relatively uncontrolled settings. But there are still some applications which are not, which can only be done based on face recognition. So since we, I work closely with the Michigan State Police, they gave me this slide. So Michigan State uh, driver motor vehicle has about 30 million photos, okay? And they want to have a system by which somebody comes, applies for a driver license. They want to search his photo against the 30 million database to find out whether he's already in the database, right? And without, it's only when they did this prototype that they found the fake driver licenses. In the same record, there are mul photographs of multiple individuals, okay? So I, I was able to go to the Motor Vehicle Bureau and they get a driver license under Tommy's name, okay? And the only way to find that out is by doing face search. Okay, so that's what this is about. The, so, I, so I visited them 10 days ago. I said, you know, because now they say we can stop somebody for traffic violation on the highway, take the photo using the mobile phone which the officers carry, send it to the central database, search and within a few minutes they will get an answer whether you are wanted for, you know, some, some, something, right? So I said, okay, test my system. So this, he took my photo in the lobby of the Michigan State Police. And by the time we reached his office, his monitor was showing my 2009 driver license photo. So I was very impressed. Fortunately, I was happy that no other photo was there, you know? So, um, so the search was done against 30, 34 million photos. 30 million is about the motor vehicle, and then 4 million are the mugshot, which is in the, in the police database, okay? So then I said, okay, let me see how robust this system is. So now in his office, I said, take my photo. And this time I removed my glasses, I smiled a little bit, and I stood near the window. Okay, and by the way, this is one of the top face recognition engines which is commercially available, which, is, which they are using. Sorry? What's the name? Which, which uh, engine is this? Uh, this is NEC. 
Okay, so NEC is sort of one of the, among the major vendors, it's one of the best performing systems. So they show top five matches from the driver license database and top five matches from the criminal database. Okay? And what you notice is that it's basically retrieving people who are showing their teeth. <laughs> right? So it's homing in on the wrong thing. Right? So, but there are other places where the system is being used for a while and it is successful. So this is the border crossing system in, in Australia and New Zealand called SmartGate. It's, you know, if you, are, if you have an e-passport with a chip um, which has a photo in it and um, it's, if you're from EU countries or some other countries, then you can basically self uh, uh, authenticate yourself and cross the border. You, you scan the passport, uh, you, you, you stand in front of a camera and it compares the photos. Okay? And this is at the Hong Kong Shenzhen border. Hundreds of thousands of people cross that border every day. But here they use a fusion of face and fingerprint. Uh, locating intruders, uh, this is the um, system inside a, inside a company, they want to identify if there is a person who's not supposed to be where, where he is. Okay. Uh, there is a, one of my former students who returned to China, he has a company, and at the train station in, so Chengdu is in the province of Sichuan, it's at the border, um, at the, um, uh, where there's a lot of Muslim population and they're, who, are, who are Xinjiang province and they're having some problems, so they keep track of who is buying the train tickets. So this is similar to what I showed you earlier. They scan their ID card, camera takes their photo, and then see whether they are eligible to, to, to purchase the train ticket. <clears throat> now, face search has been, is being used, but face search mostly relies on the tagging. So they already know in this case that this is Obama's photo, so it's no problem. It retrieves all the photos of the Obama. So I asked my postdoc, Kai, I said, okay, suppose we enter your name, you're not so famous yet. So they, can, they won't recommend any tag for him, okay? And so if you see the Google search, image search, gives these results. Okay, now it, it, the system doesn't say, I don't know you. It will find face images. If Baidu, same image sent to Baidu, it finds all Asian people. So this, uh, so it's not just the human bias in, in, in face recognition, it's the machine bias also. You know, probably this engine has been trained on large number of Asian faces as opposed to the Google face engine. So what about the video surveillance, which is really the biggest application of face recognition? I mean, the number of surveillance cameras which are being deployed around the world is growing really, really large, right? So the only trial I could find where video surveillance was tried was in the, by the German Federal Police in Mainz train station in 2007. Okay, so there they, they recruited about 300 volunteers, okay, who will be going through the train station, okay, and, and they will measure the performance based on these 300, uh, you know, recruiters, recruits, you know. And what they found was that the accuracy um, is only 60% true accept rate at 0.1% false accept rate in the daytime, during the daylight. At night, of, it will drop significantly, okay? Of course, after 9-11, it was also tried at the Logan Airport because majority of the uh, uh, terrorists boarded the flight at Logan Airport, and it was miserable. After a few months, it was, it was removed. So you're saying that 22 people will be harassed every day? Yep. And this is, this is only a small number of, you know, <laughs> these targeted people, you know, I mean, at a major airport or, and so on, there's a just huge number of people who are passing through. So it's not ready. 
I know China is also doing the same thing. You know, we talked about 3D. So when they have, when they arrest some, somebody, they take the 3D image of the suspect. So you have now a model. And then there is a surveillance camera. This is, this, they just installed it. I don't know how, how well it will do, but you know, that's the types of things they are doing. There are some applications we are faced in addition to the identity, you may also want to do some demographic estimation, the gender, you know, ethnicity, age range. Age range does not do very well. I mean, the gender is okay. I mean, you know, but if you're cropping the face as somebody pointed out, you know, the, the gender can be thrown off. So I already mentioned to you about this face unlock. This is Samsung, we released it in 2011 for the, oh, I thought the sound is not here. But anyway, the child is trying to get into the, unlock the phone, but doesn't work. And the, and the, uh, the father who is the real owner of the thing, it works. So now the question is, how do we increase the application coverage? Well, if you want to increase the application coverage, you need to know about the application requirement. Because unless you know the application requirements, you don't know which application to target and whether the algorithm which you have is, is quite ready or not. So operating environment means it's outdoor, indoor, you know, is, is the user going to be cooperative or uncooperative? That's a big thing. Accuracy. Most of the time we don't know what the system accuracy is. So I talked to, in India, they have this Aadhaar program where they issue 12 digit unique ID number to every resident. And they're capturing 10 fingerprints, two iris images, and they also take face. Right now, they don't use face for deduplication. They only use 10 fingerprints and two iris. But now, because most smartphones have a camera, or every smartphone has a camera, they would like to have authentication application built using using face. So let's say I go to, um, uh, so in India, there is a system where the government gives subsidized staples to uh, people with limited income. So you can buy sugar and grain, rice at these, at these uh, places. And so they need to be authenticated to make sure that to cut down the fraud. So now they're saying we would like to explore the use of face uh, instead of fingerprint and iris. So I said, what kind of accuracy do you want? So they want FAR of 0.01%, okay? And all the evaluations I have shown you are at FAR of 0.1%, okay? Fingerprints can, can meet this requirement without any problem. Fingerprints can operate at FAR of 0.01% and give you FRR of less than 1%, but not face yet. What's FRR? F uh, false reject rate. So you, you, know, you really are the genuine person, but you're not being recognized, right? So, so the true accept rate, other way to say is true accept rate is about 98%. Okay. The other is the speed and throughput. Template size is important, especially if you are doing things on a mobile phone or, or other applications. You know, it should be robust to spoof attacks, usability. I mean, there are some un phone unlock systems where you had to show specific expression. I mean, that's not, I don't think that's very usable. And of course, cost is also important. Now in many government applications, cost is not a big issue, but uh, in consumer applications it is. So, wh so what do we, what problems do we need to solve? Well, face detection has improved a lot but still not perfect, right? So unless we can do, detect a face, we won't be able to do the recognition. So here is a, you know, face in, faces in a crowd. Some faces can be detected, but some cannot. Um, so that's, that's, that's the one challenge. The second is having a robust representation. So, so this, is, this is related to facial aging. So this is the same woman who has been arrested multiple times. The first time she was arrested in 1995, and then this is the last time, February 2005. So over a 10 year period, the face has changed a lot. Now everybody ages differently. It's not that all of us are aging in the same way. I mean, it becomes on the lifestyle and other things. 
And below this, I'm showing you the face score, again, from one of the top matchers. If I put this in the gallery, and then these are the probe images, the face score drops significantly, right? So how do we account for it? People have attempted to use 3D face models and so on and introduce the aging, but then you need to know what is the time, time gap before you can adjust it. And then this is the, you know, two different people, but they look alike, right? So that's, a, uh, that's another issue. And then the issue of robust matching. So, and this is where you start now handling full pose variations in the face image. So, this is, this subject is in the IJB uh, Janus database. She happens to be one of the very famous Indian film actress. Um, so, for frontal images, the, the face is well detected. The landmarks using the DLIB public domain software gets detected well. But you know, if you have start having images like that, that becomes difficult. You and I can recognize the person, but it's, it's, it's difficult to, to do that with the systems. Other is how do we use the micro features in the face? I mean, face, face contains other information as well. So in this particular case, this person was arrested based on the surveillance. This is the surveillance image and this is the person after he was arrested based on this, uh, you can call it a tattoo or some kind of a mark, okay? This is a famous tattoo called teardrop tattoo. And you know, these are typically notorious people, but it doesn't uniquely identify person, but it narrows down the, the, the list. And identical twins, uh, which could be recognized by some facial marks. So, uh, FBI is very interested in identical twins, and every year there is a twin festival in, in a city called Twinsburg, Ohio. And FBI contracts out people to go and, and collect twin, twin face images to see how we can distinguish them. And finally, what is the capacity of face recognition? I mean, we just do have no idea. If somebody asks me, okay, Assuming I'm willing to give you all the subjects and frontal, neutral expression, how many, how many face identities can you resolve using face recognition? We don't know. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's better to know, okay, I can handle 10,000 face database and I can give you this true accept rate at this false accept rate. We, we just don't know how to address this. So the reason why face recognition and other biometric recognition is important is because we cannot trust credentials to answer the question who is there, right? I mean, 20 years ago, we could trust people when they went through with a passport at the airport, not anymore, right? So machine face recognition is a hard problem Successful applications rely on constrained image capture and cooperative subjects. Okay, and that's why for passport, driver license photos, you're not supposed to have accessories on the face and you're supposed to have a neutral expression. Are the deployed systems meeting the requirements? We really don't know how well the deduplication applications are working. I mean, if they, they always publicize the high profile cases, uh, that you know, we caught this guy because we were using fingerprints, but we don't know how many we missed, right? And I personally think that if, if the goal is to identify person who is there, face alone is not adequate to answer that question. We need to know some other information besides the pixel values on the face, right? Okay, with that, I stop, thank you.